Hello, BookTube! As some of you may know, June is host to an inaugural BookTube event called June on the Range, which was created by Michael K. Vaughn, and I'm one of the hosts. There are a bunch of other great hosts. We're having a ball in the month of June, reading westerns, shining a spotlight on what was once the king of all the genres of fiction, and is now completely gone. Nobody really reads or writes westerns anymore. Certainly nobody makes a living at it. Uh, and once upon a time, it was the only game in town, or the foremost one, in books, on the radio, on TV, in the movie theaters. It, they were inescapable. Uh, and it was an inspired idea to devote a month to reading westerns. And I have been surprised, to put it mildly, at the strength of the reaction that I have seen from all kinds of... I leave my email on every video. I'm, you can email about anything you want. And I have been receiving tons of emails from people, from you, saying that you never gave Westerns a chance and now you're glad that you're reading them or, or uh, striking a sentimental tone, that your father or your grandfather read tons of Westerns, read nothing else, but you always thought it, that those sort of died with him and now you're reclaiming that part of your memories because you're suddenly loving some of the books that, that, you're, that they love. That has been just fantastic. That sentimental element does not apply to me. Uh, but So it's been all the more fascinating for me to learn. And I have been popping down Westerns like crazy. Far more than I've been talking about on this channel. I have been reading like crazy. Uh, and in the course of that reading, there have been some rough patches. And one of them cropped up just this week. Some of you may have seen just a tiny bit of uh, friction between the trail boss, Michael K. Vaughn, and one of his trusted hands, yours truly. Uh, because he did a video, a really good video, if I remember I'll link to it, but you should go to his channel and find it, where he talks about his top ten favorite Western authors. Uh, and some of them I knew, but some of them I did not know, or I knew only their names because I used to work in a bookstore for a long time, so you know the names even if you haven't read the author. But I hadn't experienced a lot of them, and I tried my hand at one of them, Nelson Nye, and it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work at all. I tried it once, twice, then thrice, and it did not work. Uh, and that caused a, 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 a little bit of concern <laughs> from, all, from all you tenderfeet in town about whether or not there might be trouble at OK Corral. <laughs> uh, and because that's the case, you might think that I would tread lightly. But no, I have ridden straight back into Rattlesnake Gap. <laughs> I decided to go back to that video and pick another author. There was one of Michael K. Vaughn's favorite Western authors to see, or is this just a case where his reading tastes and mine are completely different? And I won't like any of them, but that can't be true, because it, it, despite the fact that we poke fun at each other all the time, we have a lot of the same reading tastes. And I mean, I don't just mean an inordinate love of Edgar Rice Burroughs and Robert E. Howard. I mean going all the way back to Periclean Athens. So, so I figured maybe I just got off on the wrong foot. So I tried another author. And this is an author I've sold in bookstores 80 million times. Never occurred to me to read him. So I, I have now read my very first Elmer Kelton novel. Uh, it was this one, Buffalo Wagons, uh, and it's terrific. So I feel a lot better about June on the Range. This was terrific. And I, I'm not going to belabor the point, but El Elmer Kelton came from the exact same kind of, of Western writing background as Nelson Nye. He wrote at the same time, almost, uh, and he doesn't do any of the things that Nelson Nye was, <laughs> was doing, or hardly any of them. Yonder appears quite often in this book. And there, there, there is a bit of sensationalism, but I got a human story. I got a human story with humans in it instead of uh, Hopalong Cassidy caricatures. I, if I'd, maybe if I'd grown up loving Westerns, I would get off on Hopalong Cassidy caricatures uh, where bullets whiz and characters talk like nobody's ever spoken in, in the history of the world. But I didn't grow up on that. I, I wasn't imprinted sentimentally. So I kind of want my characters to be human, and oh my god, <laughs> oh my god, I now want to read everything that this author wrote. This is uh, a story that raises some questions that we've been talking about on June on the Range, although I haven't made as many videos of the meta kind as I want to. I want to talk about West what Westerners are and what they do, and I will. I'm just so caught up in the individual books that I haven't made those videos. But one of the questions that's come up along those lines is, when is a Western? What? is a Western. What isn't a Western? And that brings up the question of time, you know, time periods, time scales. And this book starts out in a very particular time scale. 
it starts out with our, our main character, Gage, lamenting the fact that he is a buffalo hunter without anything to hunt. The big herds look to be gone. Herds so big that they once took days to pass a stationary viewer. You could set up a camp, and the herd would be passing by you for days. The same herd. Thousands of animals. And there were a group of those herds they, that had different regions. That they were so big and so regular that they had names. And they're all gone. At the beginning of this book, there's a harrowing scene where our main character and his crew are just, they're desperately hunting for enough buffaloes to, to enough buffalo hides to fill a couple of wagons to bring back to town just to make their keep. Whereas in earlier days, it, it, the the plains were covered in buffalo. It was easy to be a buffalo hunter and make your keep. It was, it was easy to become wealthy. Uh, as one character points out in this novel, uh, something one character underscores what is what you realize in the course of this novel, which is very much an adventure story. It's not it's not just a lament for the disappearance of the buffalo. But one character points out something that really strikes you when you think about it, which is that that change from endless seas of buffalo, literally endless seas, where they, the, the herd is, it vanishes out of sight in one direction and out of sight in the other direction. So the whole thing stretches for more than a whole day to pass. The, the time frame between that reality and the reality of buffaloes being gone from the plains was easily within the adult lifespan of a single human being. Which is pretty amazing. And, and the characters comment on it here, that, that it just that they, they easily remember a time when it seemed like there was an infinite number of buffalo. It seemed like they would never be exterminated. Uh, it's a little bit of a daring thing. I think it was probably a lot less... I think this came out in the 1950s. And I think it was probably a lot less daring a choice for Elmer Kelton then than now to try to make elephant killers, or buffalo killers, seem sympathetic. I, I don't know that you could write this book today, uh, Certainly, I wasn't expecting to like any of the men whose job it is to wipe out this incredible species. We could all be looking at those incredible herds if it hadn't been for these people. Uh, nevertheless, I did come to like Gage, the main character. He is a fully fleshed out human being. And uh, I came to like his quest as well. It, once the opening is done and he is bringing his meager proceeds back to town to get them transferred into money and to talk to all of his friends in town. He's well-known and well-liked in town. He's a likable, noble guy, uh, despite butchery being his profession. Once he gets back to town, he conceives of a quest. He thinks that the buffalo herds have not vanished, but instead moved south to Texas. And that if he gets off the plains and heads south into Texas, he will find those endless herds again. It's really kind of touching. Uh, because it's not just, it's made clear over and over again, it's not just the buffalo that he's questing for. It's an earlier, more pristine West that he remembers, but that is gone. The towns are sharper, uglier, meaner places. The people who are flooding those towns and flooding the trails are meaner, sharper, more quotidian people. It's a less heroic West, not just because of the lack of the buffalo, but because of the lack of so much else. That's really what he's questing for, not the big herds that he, that he envisions finding in, in Texas. Although, envisioning finding those herds, is, the practicalities of that is the main driving force of this book. He has just enough money between him and a private backer to outfit a string of wagons and a string of horses and go to Texas. Go and in search of that big herd. That one last big herd. And Although he's reluctant to take people on board who might want to, you know, countermand his advice, he wants to be sole master of this wagon train, he does. He takes on an old, grizzled friend of his who has uh, no money left, no prospects at all. Uh, I, when, he, when I was reading this book, I wanted to tell that old man uh, that he should watch some Hollywood action stories because he's doomed. <laughs> He wouldn't go on that trip if he knew that he was in a Hollywood action story. He's the one who's going to die. I mean, that's just the pattern of these things. There's no way. You, someone's going to have to die to goose the plot forward. And it's not going to be... Anyway. It's the equivalent of, you know, the the old black partner cop who's got a, a wife and kids at home and he's one day away from retirement. It's that sort of cliche where when that character shows up in an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, you know he's going to die. You know that he isn't, that he isn't going to make it to the end of the movie. Same thing here. If you have got an old salt who's on the trail, mm, I don't think so. But in addition to that, uh, Gage encounters a man named Ransom King. 
And in case you're thinking, well, why are you saying you like this book when it's as unbelievable as anything else? I want to point out that characters in the novel point out that Ransom King is almost certainly a pseudonym. That nobody is actually called something like that, and that plenty of people come out west and call themselves by names their mothers didn't give them. Great little moment, and fine, all I need. Ransom King is very charismatic. He isn't, an, an, at sight, a villain. In fact, he and Gage instinctively like each other. He has a henchman, uh, who's this big hulking guy who's obviously a psychopathic killer, but is under King's command. And when, originally Gage doesn't want King along, he says, you know, we are too alike, you would want to have a say in how I run this this buffalo drive, and I don't want that. I don't want anyone to have a say but me. King swears, I no, I, I'm in it for the proceeds. I won't, you're the leader, I won't buck your command at all. But he brings his henchman, Trencher, along, even though you know that's going to make trouble. And Elmer Kelton has to find, or not Elmer Kelton, <laughs> Gage has to find a whole bunch of other people to go along, in addition to the doomed old guy, and in addition to the, the, the dodgy uh, slicker and his criminal henchman. He has to find a whole bunch of other people, and then they have to go on the trek. And then the number one worry that they have is not the distance or the hardship, it's Indians. Uh, at one point early on in the novel, they encounter uh, a Cheyenne chief. Or not, a, not a chief, but a, Cheyenne, a senior Cheyenne brave. A senior warrior who approaches them in, in halting English, and the old man knows how to, how, a few words in Cheyenne, asks them what they're doing, tells them that they're straying off the lands guaranteed by treaty to the Cheyenne, uh, that they really ought to turn back, that, that sort of thing. Gage wants to assure them, we're just traveling through here. We're not hunting buffalo on your territory. We're going south to Texas. And when he makes that clear, the Cheyenne brave uh, sort of sardonically says, well, that's good news because you're heading into Comanche territory and that means you're one less group of white guys I need to worry about because you'll die. You'll all die. And Gage is constantly thinking about encountering uh uncontrolled Native American war bands. Uh, some of the, the horrific Western settlement policies uh, of the American government are laid bare just conversationally here. It's mentioned at one point that uh, the government has a great interest in exterminating the buffalo. The government's all for that. The U.S. government is all for that because all of the Native American tribes of the High Plains and the South rely on buffaloes. Once they're gone, the reservations are going to look mighty tempting. That's how it's put. Uh, it's put that way with a lot less judgment than I think it would be today, but it's still... Elmer Kelton, I think, had a heart and a soul. I think that's obvious, even from this one book, uh, that, he, that he might have been a very different kind of writer from Nelson Nye, uh, because he clearly doesn't like anything of what's going on here. And he carries the story through. Uh, there's a woman in, who gets involved uh, at, and, and involves Gage's heart, reluctantly, but still sincerely. And there is a better effort, especially in the second half of the book, there's a better effort on Elmer Kelton's part to make that woman a real individual. Not like anything in Riders by Night. Not like anything in Nelson Nye's book, Riders by Night. It, by the end of this book, that woman has pulled Gage's fat out of the fire a couple of times and also done a real good turn for the whole of the Buffalo train. Uh, and I was reading this, and I was thinking, okay, well, I've never read you before. Now I see why so many customers came in asking for you and wanted to know if there's anything new. I should have taken that as a tip when it was happening in the bookstore. I don't know why I didn't. Uh, that was always invaluable to me. If, if serious, you know, sober, intelligent customers would come in and say, I really like this author. Got anything new? Maybe there's a new reprint. I'll, I'll take that. In addition to helping them, I always help them, and I always want to know how their, how their job was going, how the wife and kids were. But in addition to that, I should have paid attention. I often did. And think, okay, if this has engaged your present considered loyalty in this manner, then I should read it. And I didn't. I could kick myself. I'm glad I'm getting to it now. June on the Range. The magic of June on the Range. Same for me as for you. Now that I've encountered this author, I was reading along this book. I was 200 pages in. I was thinking, okay, <coughs> you have a great story here especially Ransom King, who's sort of wavering on the line of being a good guy or a bad guy. Who is he? Where does this charisma of his come from? And, and to what extent is he the enabler of his horrible henchman trencher, or is he the opposite? 
what what is the, the is this obviously going to come down to Ransom King and Gage? How is that going to work when they seem like they could be best friends? I was thinking about all that 200 and some pages in, and I was thinking, all right, well, you've got me involved, definitely. But I wonder if you're going to remember the bigger issues that everyone was talking about in Dodge City before the wagon train set out, which is that the whole West is changing and that the Buffaloes aren't magically gone south. They, they are just plain gone. And I don't want to spoil the ending of the book, but Elmer Kelton does not forget anything. He's a fantastic storyteller, if this one book is anything to go by. But I realize it's not. Uh, so, duty, out of duty to June on the Range, and also, since you can see right through me, I'm happy to admit, also because wild horses couldn't keep me away, I'm going to read a few more books by this guy, <laughs> absolutely. See if maybe I got a fluke that I was drawn to only because this is one hell of a cover. Maybe I got a fluke, or maybe he's just generally good. I'm thinking he's probably just generally good, because he made Michael K. Vaughn's list, and there were all those customers, most of whom have probably gone into their graves by now. But they came in month after month. Anything new? Anything coming from this guy? They didn't even think to ask for a biography. And as far as I know, there's never been one. And that's a crime. I say that all the time on this channel, that, that uh, all, the, all the usual suspects, 10 people, get 10 biographies every year, and all the other millions of people who deserve one don't. Just reading this book, without knowing anything about Elmer Kelton, I wanted to know about him. The man is on the page enough for me to want to know about his life. Uh, so, <laughs> so June on the Range is going splendidly for me in terms of heading into this weekend, which is good, because the weekend doesn't have anything else in store that's pleasant at all. Instead, it has tooth-grinding, ear-shaking, dust-covering construction work. Don't get me started. <laughs> so I'm going to use these things in exactly the way all of those old customers of mine did, as a perfect form of intelligent escapism. <laughs> so I don't know if it'll be an Elmer Kelton book that I read next time we do a June on the Range. I'm afraid my, I'm burying my co-host with June on the Range videos, just like I did Book Trek. And, you know, it, it's no sooner going to end with June on the Range than it'll be August when Book Trek 2022 starts again, and then it all happens all over again. And August is also Garb August. Garbage in August. I've heard from so many of you that you wouldn't have it any other way. And in my own defense, I've also heard from all of my co-hosts on those events saying, no, go ahead, make as many videos as you want. So, And I can't help it. I'm just chatty when it comes to books. So probably tomorrow will be another June on the range, but I don't know who it will be. I don't know if, I'll, if I won't. Will I be able to resist the temptation to do another Elmer Kelton right away? Or will I move on to somebody completely different? Uh, and just save some of his for later. I have a whole bunch of his novels, and now I'm glad that I do. Oh my, am I glad that I do. Uh, so anyway, June on the Range for today, Buffalo Wagons, terrific book. If you ever come across this, uh, you should read it. It's, it's, it's really, really good. Uh, so anyway, that is June on the Range for today, a very happy discovery. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two. <laughs>